yeah, man, I, this one caught me. I, I didn't see this one. I, I, being, you know, member of George's club, I do tend to have some more crystal ball moments in my time, you know, kind of see what's going on up there. I didn't see this one. I'll be honest. I, who's this? Uh, this uh, is my sidekick. Magic head. I'm getting a reading. I'm getting a reading right now, yes. Ripping out the COVID AV, Yamaha UC is shutting down, and how Zoom drives AV room design. All that and more, next on AV Week. This is AV Week, episode 658, recorded Friday, March 29th, 2024. User experience. This is AV Week, the biggest stories of the AV industry that we've gathered uh, with us. Uh, my name is Tim Albright. With us to discuss those very stories. First and foremost, Gina San Severo from Atlas IED. Welcome, ma'am. Thank you for having me, Tim. It is always a pleasure to be on AV Week with you. We appreciate it. Also with us is Justin Watts, which I have to scratch out Apple and put in AMD now. AMD, how are you, sir? <laughs> We're doing well, sir. We're doing well. I'm one away from the fang. One away. So Netflix, if you're listening, I am might be available. I don't know. But if you're out there, uh, I'm close. All right. You're not close. You're in Austin. Netflix has often... Most Netflix employees are remote. Okay. Well, there you go. All right. Then I'm close as well. Netflix. Uh, I can I can hat trick and get a work from home job at the same time. Last but not least, George Chaco, fresh off of his vacation uh, from Pace University, also from Bald AV Guys. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me, Tim. Let's go Mets, opening day. Uh, we're already up one nothing. if anyone's keeping track. So we, we, we will mention this briefly because I, I, this is my annual uh, reminder to everybody that I hate baseball. Uh, <laughs> I live in St. Louis. Yes, I am a Cardinals fan. If I have to be pressed on it, we are recording this on the 29th of March, opening day for the hallowed sport. No, no, yesterday was opening day. Today's the home opener, yeah. A oh, home opener for a lot, it's a home opener for a lot of folks, right? And you're already one game back. So, and yes, the Cardinals are already one game back. So <laughs> that's all I'm gonna say about that. All righty. Uh, one very unfortunate thing happened this, oh, a couple, you know, a couple things, but one uh, story, our first story this week is Yamaha UC is closing down. Uh, Yamaha Corporation has announced its decision to dissolve, quote unquote, it's wholly owned subsidiary, Yamaha Unified Communications, also known as Yam Yamaha UC, that specialized in the sale of conference system equipment in the U.S. Yamaha bought Revo, Revo Labs in 2014 and rebranded it as Yamaha UC. The company has been responsible for products such as the Odessia ceiling arrays, sound bars, and personal devices, all markets that are already pretty saturated with other competitors. Yamaha cites changes in the market environment as the preliminary reason for the liquidation uh, with sales of conferencing systems uh, equipment in the U.S. being handled by Yamaha Corporation of America moving forward. The decision is expected to result in an increase in consolidated net profit of approximately two and a half billion with a B dollars. Uh, due to tax effect accounting and other factors. Net math is not my strong suit. I don't know how that works. Yamaha's stock has hovered around 20 bucks US for the, over a month, and there was very little range, very little change since the announcement on March 27th. Several news organizations have reached out to Yamaha for comment on what this means to employees, what this means to people who are customers. Uh, no uh, response from that as of 12 o'clock Eastern on Friday the 29th. We don't know. Um, like, like I said, there you're still going to have products coming out of Yamaha Americas. One would assume that there is backlog somewhere, but there's no indication of what that means going forward. So once they run out of that backlog, is Yamaha Americas or Yamaha corporate going to continue to do R&D? Are they going to continue to market this or continue to sell it? Last time we checked, which again was noon Eastern on Friday the 29th, both companies still had a booth listed on Infocom's website on uh, on the Infocom 24 show floor. They're right next to each other. I'm not going to tell Yamaha what to do, but obviously they can just combine the spaces. Justin, we're going to start with you on this. What does this mean? What does this say, rather, uh, about the UC market in general? I think one thing we've seen over the past, say, five, six years is there's been a lot of consolidation in this market when it comes to what we see in the environment. And this is a great example of them looking at that business and turning it into something that I, they're trying to, to capitalize on. 
I struggle a bit with this because I, I'm the guy, if you know me, I don't care whose name's on the box. I'll buy it if it meets my customer my user experience, my customer requirements. And so I bought Yamaha stuff in the past and it does a fantastic job. Um, Yamaha being one of the longer names in the industry, I'm, I was definitely intrigued to see how UC moved in their space. Um, yeah, man, I, this one caught me. I, I didn't see this one. I, I, being, you know, a member of George's club, I do tend to have some more crystal ball moments in my time, you know, kind of see what's going on up there. I didn't see this one. I'll be honest. Uh, I'd seen some movement in there. I saw some good development in those spaces. Um, pretty big fan of their speakerphone products when it comes to the, the, the UC environment and conference rooms. Watch see how it plays out. Right. And, and for those of you not, not watching the video, Justin has as much hair as Chaco does. <laughs> And Chaco hosts the Bald AV Guys podcast, so I'll let you pull that one off. <laughs> it's the crystal ball, yeah, man. <laughs> that, no, that's what that is. Okay, just carry yeah. it on with you. Gina, same kind of question. What does this mean to the industry, but also what does it mean to these folks that, again, right now are in limbo, uh, probably looking for, for their next adventure? It's interesting because it's been 10 years um, that they've had for that for that acquisition of Riva Labs. And, you know, it, it sounds like they've done a really great job of navigating the changing landscape for the, the UC environment um, through COVID and everything else. But man, I have to tell you, you, you use the right word. It is quite a saturated uh, part of the industry. And if their market share was just not making sense for them to continue moving forward, R and D is expensive. Product development is expensive. Market intelligence is expensive. I mean, all of that has to be taken into account. And is it worth it for those the, those long term um, changes? And and we're seeing a lot of companies bringing people back into the office. Boardrooms being used again. Um, but what is what does the future of that look like? Uh, and and I think the uncertainty. I think that the, you know, again, the saturation probably um, kind of caused them to rethink this. And Yamaha has a great name. Um, so I think that they're kind of standing up to their standards and saying, okay, well, long term, this doesn't meet our standards for, for our operations. So yeah. we're going to move on. Um, I do feel bad for the individuals. Hopefully they can be absorbed somewhere else within the company. Uh, and, and it doesn't sound like maybe that plan has, has yet been discussed because they're not getting back to the media. But uh, ultimately, I, I hope that there is going to be um, some, some great talent out in the industry that's probably available. And I hope they get scooped up really quickly. Yeah, yeah, I do too. Uh, there are some really great folks, some really, really smart folks as well. Uh, George, same kind of question here is, is what does this mean to the industry, but also uh, as, as somebody who just like Justin, you guys are responsible for not standardizing, but standardizing, right? You, you, you do like to standardize on having the same equipment. What happens when a company like this decides to, again, Yamaha is not going under. They're not, you know, Yamaha UC products right now are still going to be available through Yamaha Americas. But, you know, should they run on a product and decide not to go forward with this? How would you guys decide on what to replace when it comes to brand X over brand Y? Sure. I mean, speaking from an education standpoint, you know, standardize is, is, the, is the name of the game, really. Like it's you have, you know what you have, you know what you like, and that's what you use. So, you know, to echo what Gina and Justin said, this is definitely a case of, case of saturation i mean there are so many players in the game you know with the uc stuff you have biamp has crestron has sennheiser i mean you name it all the all the players have it right and uh and a company like yamaha huge company like yamaha that picks up we're a copycat industry at the end of the day for for the most part right picks up oh let me pick up on this trend and then eventually starts to realize they caught on too late Maybe, I don't know. I'm guessing. I'm making things up probably. But uh, from a university standpoint, we know what we use. We know what's in our conference rooms. We know what's in our classrooms. Yeah. And that's what we standardize on. And that's what we keep going back to. And, and one thing on that one, um, I was a huge Revo Labs fan when they first came out. Like, I was the dude that was trying to get all the POs I could to buy that stuff, right? Because it was just an amazing product. And that's one of the things that kind of gets me right here is that, you know, I followed Yamaha because they bought Revo Labs and there's so much, there was so much movement in that space. 
Um, I, that's where me personally, from you know, dumb end user, I apologize. I would have capitalized in that because there was so much in that space. Why didn't we see more from that in a real apps perspective versus the rest of the market? I mean, you know, they, they have the video collaboration spaces where they have the video bars and whatnot, and I get that. But to George and Gina's point, everyone has those. Uh, maybe this just was the point where we needed to focus on that that part of the product and move it forward. I don't know. Um, but man, it does, it stings. I hate seeing these kind of things in the environment. You just took me back, Justin, that eraser type microphone that they came out with the like The yep. lipstick oh, mic, man. man. The lipstick okay. mic. That thing was amazing, right? You could literally deploy 24 of them in a scenario, put it yeah. on someone, like clip it into their shirt, walk yeah. around. It answered a yeah, need. It was, and it was you know, a great product, yeah. We don't... There's a great product, fantastic product. I don't follow um, the the UC kind of conference space on a day to day. Um, I kind of get glimpses of it here and there, and especially at trade shows, right? So, so in my day to day, I can't answer this question. When Yamaha bought Revo Labs and Yamaha became well, that became Yamaha UC. Did you see the same type of innovation or was it kind of floating on what everybody else was doing then? Because that would probably be unfortunate, but also kind of answer the question. Like with most um, mergers or purchases, however you, want to, however you want to slice it, I think the entire industry kind of held their breath for a second, right? Because you have someone with a name like Yamaha when it came to audio, which is ubiquitous with you know, the majority of our industry for the last several, several, several decades. Uh, when they picked up Revo Labs, I think we were all kind of like, this, this is it, right? Revo Labs is this, Yamaha is this. We're going to start funneling R&D dollars into this and then boom, we're going to have this amazing, you know, what's the next thing, right? I'll be honest, I didn't really see a whole lot beyond just trying to maintain yeah. the status quo. And that's not terrible, especially if you don't know, you know, in the long run where you're landing with something, if something works, you know, the old adage, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. That's not a terrible place to be. But you do still need to innovate to ensure that you're meeting market requirements and user experience, uh, you know, level leveling up. Yeah. So, you know, I, I personally, again, this is Justin Watts saying this. I didn't see a huge ramp like I think the rest of the industry expected when these two things came together. But, again, maybe that's kind of where we are now. Absolutely. Alrighty. Uh, next story comes to us from our friends over AV Magazine. They pulled on a report looking at people re, well, quite frankly, taking out their COVID AV and replacing it. Four years after the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic, enterprises are still grappling with its lingering effects, with nearly a third of AV professionals citing unresolved issues and backlogs as their top challenges, according to a new report from sister, system integrator Kenley. Study found that 41% need to completely replace the technology installed during COVID lockdown, up 23% in 2023. Additionally, additionally, nearly half of the respondents plan to remove and replace AV technology that was installed before the pandemic. Pause for two seconds. Everybody think about what was done in your offices or your campuses and think about taking a half of it out. All right. However, AV budgets have been reduced for half of the respondents. <laughs> this math doesn't work, and math is not my strong suit. 62% have been tasked with achieving more with less, according to the uh, report. Uh, the importance of AV is still recognized with two-thirds of AV teams having an established plan in place for future pandemics. Good God, I hope not. And three-quarters having a clearly defined workplace communication strategy. Gina, where are we seeing... Um, folks going in and saying take all this stuff out it was haphazard it was ad hoc and and how exactly do you go about doing that on a college campus that is quite frankly slow to move sometimes no offense taken <laughs> <laughs> um tim i will be honest with you and these are my opinions only i just want to say that um to be clear i read that and i was like Kinley has a vested interest in these numbers. Kinley has a okay. vested interest in making sure that equipment is turned more quickly than maybe it could or should be. Um, so that was my initial thought. 
I have not, I have heard people say we, we probably need to upgrade in the next year or two. I have not heard a lot of end users um, or in-house integrators say that we're pulling all of our COVID era equipment out. Um, yes, of course there are some, I'm, I'm just not hearing it at, at that number. And so when I thought about it and I saw who put this out and I saw the coverage and I was like, okay, there's, there's gotta be something here that just makes it a little bit fishy. All right. Jacko, same kind of question is, is, is you know, and no offense taken, I, I worked for many years in inside higher education. N nothing as big as pace, but, you know, at least 10 years ago, we didn't move very quickly. Yeah. So um, how do you do this? Um, uh, Gina, I share your opinion. I think this is Kinley's perspective per se. Um, no one's ripping out everything that they have in a box or in a classroom, in a conference room. It's not, it's not realistic, right? And we at Pace, we have a four to five year uh, equipment cycle replacement in place, which works really well for us. But that doesn't mean I'm going to rip out a laser projector with less than 10% of usage just because it's come up on four year life cycle, right? That's crazy to think that I'm gonna spend, you know, eight, nine, $10,000 on a projector just because it's post pandemic, right? So during the pandemic, yes, we scrambled, we put our heads together, we got, you know, the Zoom carts, so to speak, and we put them in every classroom. I think we purchased about 150 or so of these Zoom carts and we put them in classrooms. Yes, now they're kind of, clunky and in the way and people running into them. So we're trying to get these carts out of the room, but the brains, the UC, the, the functionality remains. We put that into the podium. We put cameras in the room. We use microphones to capture the rooms. That tech is still being used. It is, I think, I my personal opinion, I think it's inaccurate that we're pulling all this stuff out. Uh, we are adapting. If things go into life, if there's any support, yes, we'll swap them out. Um, but stuff that works, if it ain't broke, don't fix it. All right. Watch. You're just sitting there shaking your head as these two are talking. So I'll just let you go. Uh, I, uh, Gina, you, you hit the nail on the head when you said when you read it. I looked at it. And I was like, who on earth are these folks talking to? Because one, I want their refresh cycle. If they can do that kind of stuff that quickly, I want that in my life. Because from a corporate perspective, everywhere I've worked has had a amortization cycle that's between five and six years. Right? Don't even start. Uh, two... I want to touch something that George said, and I think this is the key, one of the key reasons why you don't see a lot of these things getting ripped out. During the pandemic, uh, to use a term that when I worked at Google, that was kind of defined, you know, doing googly things, we got very scrappy, right? We had to find ways to do stuff with things that we didn't even know existed, and we couldn't find half the parts to make it work, right? One of the things I learned during the pandemic from a design perspective is that my user experience can get away with a lot less than I thought it needed, right? And from a developer perspective, it changed the way I looked at uh, designing conference rooms and designing systems because we had a lot of pieces in place that did a fantastic job and they delivered what we were looking for. But as we streamed, as we skimmed things down to provide what was available for my new builds during the pandemic and long lead times, I realized we were still meeting the user experience a lot more efficiently. So if anything out of COVID, we learned how to do our jobs a lot better. I'll be really honest. We had to dig deep. We had to figure out how to do things on the fly. And in the end, we learned to really focus on the user experience versus trying to focus on whose name's on the box in the room. So it, it, again, I'll echo everyone else. These are my opinions because I don't want to, you know, you know, take it in any other direction, yeah. but I don't see that happening. I mean, how can you justify that kind of lift? Uh, how can you also support that kind of lift? Because at the scope and scale of some of the places they were talking about, that's like a multi-year tech debt project that, you know, we're, you know, you just mentioned talking about budgets getting smaller. We're still trying to find folks to do the work now. Yeah. I don't see us tossing, tossing all this stuff on top of the tire fire right now, especially as we're just getting our feet back under us from what COVID was. Yeah. Also from a design perspective, when you design a classroom, when you design an event space, when you design, to design a conference room, scalability should and is number one priority. You can't just say in four years, I mean, there is a possibility in four years that it will go out the window, but you know, this crystal ball that we look into, 
Justin and I specifically, um, you kind of expect it to be there in four years and five years and you build to that. Right? You know what I mean? Like you don't just, oh, it's four years. We're done with that. Well, and then, then to plug it into the Yamaha story, I mean, what happens when this happens? Yeah. yeah. Right. Am I supposed to go rip out everything now that Yamaha is not? No. You develop a ramp down plan to ensure you're covering all your bases. And also, I'd argue that this is a fantastic time that if the stuff you're doing right now isn't hitting the mark when it comes to what you had to buy from Amazon during COVID to make things work, don't laugh. We, You know we all did oh, it. Um, if we're doing that, why don't you take a second and relook at your standards to ensure you're meeting the requirements in the first place, right? If we're, if we're double-clicking on these little things that are causing all this heartache because it's not a Furman branded this or a this branded that, then, you know, is it really something you need in the environment? Holistically look at it, break it down, and sure you're meeting the mark. All right. Last story then. Um, QSIS has got a Zoom solution. Not, not exa- They've had one. Anyhow, QSIS has launched the QSIS Control for Zoom Rooms app. This app allows integrators and IT end users to enable third-party room controls on all supported Zoom Room control consoles, effectively creating a single interface for controlling various room devices and services connected to the QSIS core processor. I'm going to give you a TL, you know, DR. You can now run your entire room, including your Zoom, through a QSIS panel. Not the first company to do this. Matter of fact, I saw a couple at Extron at, uh, from Extron at Enterprise Connect this week. Extron was not exhibiting, but I saw this um, at Enterprise Connect. Um, but it is kind of cool the fact that QSIS has not done this. So, George, really quickly, we'll start with you. How big of a driver is having one pane of glass, one one control interface in a Zoom room, in a Microsoft Teams room, in whatever you see platform you use, to have one place to go to control everything in the room, including your call? It's it's huge, and this really is. It's funny. I think there's a trend of topics here, um, you know, but like. Honestly, um, and we've named a couple of companies, so I'll say Pace is a big Crestron shop and we have we have had the Crestron controller, which controls the Zoom and controls the room. So I can tell you from experience that it is a huge step because um, if a faculty member walks into a room, there's one touch panel here and there's another touch panel there for Zoom. And, you know, it's, it's, it's confusing, you know what I mean? Um, for anybody, not just the faculty member. So to have a one-stop control system is huge. You know, I need to do a Zoom, boom, I hit the, the Zoom app or Team apps, or I just need to use the presentation. I select the presentation up and then my, present, my TVs are up. So uh, from a education and usability standpoint, I think it's, it's amazing. Uh, what the user interface is designed at is always the key because I've seen touch panels that have had every letter, uh, every alphabet uh, typed out on the screen. That's a full on disaster, whether you believe it or not. Uh, or you have something that has three buttons on, off and inputs. Whichever works well for you, I think the design of that user interface is critical, uh, but a big step for QSYS for sure. As somebody who has programmed that alphabet soup, that was a pain in the butt. So, Justin, I didn't do it very well, but I did do it. Justin, same question is, is how big of a deal is having that one one controller? Could y'all imagine Tim being a programmer? I I, a hundred years ago, <laughs> dude, I did it on punch cards, okay? Uh, it's, I think, you know, much like George said, I think it's an amazing uh, move forward. Uh, like you said, it's one of the things that, we see in a lot of controllers in the environment. But one of the things I think is going to be the the telltale on this one is how efficiently can it do what we're describing? Because George made a very great point about having the totality of the alphabet available on the touch panel and those kind of things. And those are programming choices, right? Those are programming choices for your user experience. You know your users and you hopefully have done studies and you look at UX to help understand what they're looking yeah. for, right? But on the flip side of that is how efficiently can we do this and how um, robust is this platform as it applies to Zoom from a serviceability perspective as well, right? Because I remember back in the day when Zoom Rooms first came out and it ran on a Mac Mini and an iPad. And from that perspective, it was a pretty slimmed down solution back in the day, but it worked, right? It did what it was supposed to do. It, the, 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 the control on the iPad looked a little kind of clinky, but we, we got by, right? 
uh, it's like it's it, it, it kind of takes back to the old Mr. Scott principle, right? The more you overtake the plumbing, the easier it is to stop the drain up. If they're adding things to this platform, and I think Qs is a fantastic platform to build off of, but as you're adding things to it, let's do it in an efficient manner so that way we're all on the same page when we do things and we don't overblow what we're trying to accomplish. Um, yeah, it's it's one of those kind of touchy areas. I'm all for a single pane of glass in a conference room that has that has no other. It, there's not two or three places to go to for my users to engage um, in this. Our, our my mantra is my users should have a frictionless experience when it comes to joining anything in a in a collaboration space. Um, that single pane of glass is a high 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 bar to meet, but it also needs to be a single efficient pane of glass. That's not going to require me to spend hours of support to ensure it's available for my users every day. Gina, a little bit different take on this. You have worked with several other companies. Uh, we'll call them, you know, um, frenemies, right? Uh, there, there are other companies that, that it's not necessarily Atlas, but you guys have worked together. Again, I was at Enterprise Connect this week. We'll talk about that at the end here. But I interviewed one of your one of those companies, SingleWire, right? How do you successfully, as a manufacturer, work together with other companies like QSIS and Zoom here? To, to successfully provide what George and, and Justin are talking about here, which is a, an excellent user experience. How do we do it? Vetting. Uh, okay. it, it absolutely comes down to vetting. It's testing. It's um, making sure that the interoperability is validated on many levels and in many different environments. Um, it's ensuring that when you say that you're partners with somebody that you truly have gone through the methodology that you need to in order to really be partners, right? And then it's it's not pointing fingers should something go wrong. It's not it's not having a user call you and say, uh, we can't get this to work and you said it would work and we would turn around and point the fingers at single wire and say, well, you should probably call them, that's their issue. No, 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 our, our support has been fully trained for our partners um, systems. And then our interoperability teams have been fully trained as well. And then if we need further support, we have a direct line into our partners. So it doesn't become our users or our clients problem, um, yeah. or beyond what it already is a problem for. Uh, so, so I think that's, that's kind of the key there. And, you know, don't, don't claim partnership without that in-depth vetting without that in-depth testing, because there's a lot of companies out there that say, oh yeah, we're fully interoperable with this, 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 as long as they use this specific protocol, that's not entirely a standard and could be misinterpreted, then maybe it'll work. There's a story Gina, there. This, this is why I love Gina. Say it louder for the folks <laughs> in the back. We just went to church on Good Friday. Amen. Thank you, Justin. Yeah. Mic drop. Doop done. This is it. Yep. This is it. I'll be going right after this call, so I haven't gotten yet. <laughs> uh, it, interesting thing about that really quickly before we wrap up here. I, in talking with, with Microsoft this week um, at Enterprise Connect, we, we, we had a conversation about their, their um, certification program, right? Products can become Microsoft certified. According to them, this is, this is straight from Microsoft, to do that takes a long time, and they acknowledge that. However, the reason it takes so long, again, this is from Microsoft, is because they 99% guarantee if they up, update a firmware or they change something on their platform, the products that are Microsoft certified are going to still work. And if they don't, they'll have a fix. Ooh, so a little bit to Gina's point. Yes. Can they guarantee that for Teams updates? Because, man, every time my Teams updates, it, something else goes wrong in Teams. Uh, uh, my understanding of their statement was yes, but I do not work for, nor do I represent Microsoft. <laughs> in all fairness, there are a lot of variables when it comes to Teams. Speaking as someone who manages a Teams client for a, a large corporation, there are a lot of variables in there. Um, but yeah, I mean, that's one of the benefits of the Microsoft component is that when stuff gets updated, it is tested and tested and tested again. And when it comes out, it's, it's pretty rock solid. Yeah. So I can't, I can't argue with that. But, you know, in talking with, with manufacturing friends, um, I don't think Gina's ever gone down this road yet, but, but other ones, 
where they're like, oh my God, it takes forever. But once it happens, right, once you get that little check mark from Microsoft, it generally is rock solid. All right. Thank you, guys. Uh, Gina San Severo from Atlas. How do people connect with you? Um, you can find me on X at Gina Sands, LinkedIn, Gina San Severo, Instagram for recipes, um, family stuff, and puppy pictures. And then at Gina.Sansvero at atlasied.com or atlasied.com at the website. Gosh, there's a lot of ways. Uh, and that's a lot of ways. Uh, Mr. Watts, thank you, sir. I appreciate your time. How do people connect with you? Uh, Justin Watts. I'm available at Paladin Machina on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter. I think it's still, no, it's X. Sorry. I got that mixed up. Don't want to get, don't want to get shut down on that one. Um, and if, you know, if you are interested in foodstuffs, uh, El Gordo's Kitchen on Instagram and Facebook is my, my, that, that was my COVID passion project that I've carried over. And, uh, it's why I, <laughs> there goes Gina. Um, yeah, food stuff on that one. And uh, hey, there's my my website is uh, out there as well. So good times. Very, very much worth it, especially if you like meat. Um, yeah. Barbecue, yes. Uh, Mr. Chaco, thank you, sir. How do people connect with you and how they, do they listen to the Bald AV Guys podcast? Sure. I wish I had gone first because it's so boring compared to these two. Uh, <laughs> uh, apparently, George Chaco is a very popular name. So on LinkedIn, you could find me at George Chaco hyphen CTS. Uh, and you could follow us on uh, Instagram, X. And I also think on TikTok, I think. But we are at Bald AV Guys. And you can check out our podcast at Bald AV Guys. Uh, coffee cables and curveballs. Nope, cables, coffee, and curveballs. And on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, wherever you get your podcasts from. All right, very good. Uh, for me, for Tim Albright, do not follow me on any social media um, because at this point I am holding up my Bears Cup because, again, I don't like baseball and waiting for the draft. Uh, but go by the web website if you would, please, avionation.tv. That's avionation.tv. You'll find this program brand new um ed tech podcast brand new women in av podcast and state of control uh, also as i mentioned a couple of times i was at enterprise connect this week with some fantastic people uh, i got to watch um uh, chris netto do a session on personal branding which was fantastic um we also did a handful of videos so you can check that out uh is because i'm i'm working mitchell to the bone so he'll be doing that all weekend and earn into next week. So you can check that out and more at avionation.tv that's avionation.tv thanks so much for listening thanks so much for watching as all the time we have for AV Week. The network for the AV industry. What are you listening to? This. This is AV. This. This. This is AV Nation. This is AV Nation.